Anthropology is defined by Webster's Dictionary as the comparative study of human societies and cultures in their development, while marine biology is defined as the scientific study of marine organisms in the ocean or other marine bodies of water. From an outside perspective, these two studies seem foreign and unrelated. However, after taking an anthropology class, I realized that anthropology does in fact relate to my major, marine biology. Firstly, anthropology gives a perspective on how humans have used marine resources over time. This happens in a variety of ways. There are fisheries that provide food in a high demand world. There is oil, which is found in nearly every marine environment and used for fuel, plastic, chemicals, and gas to cook with and to heat houses. Essentially, everything that you would normally come into contact with has an aquatic origin. For example, Sand and gravel from the bottom of rivers and oceans is used in construction to build concrete and other materials. Renewable energy that is utilized worldwide is vastly produced by the currents and streams of the oceans. The same waves that power those generators also attract scuba divers, whale watchers, and various recreational marine tourists. With all these resources available, from marine environments, it's not surprising that humans have a long history of using the water to help them survive. Any survivalist knows that when you begin to set up civilization, you want to do it by water. The first people set up by lakes and rivers because water is an essential life source. For all means of production, from foragers to industrial capitalists, water is vital to survival. Not only to drink, but also to make the land fertile for crops and animals. And because humans have traditionally settled at the end of a water flow, a mode to move a product is greatly enhanced by floating goods downstream to help with the efficiency of whatever system that particular culture uses. Traditional civilizations who used water to directly benefit the society are ancient Egypt with the Nile River, the Fertile Crescent people by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and the ancient China Yellow River people with the Indus River. These cultures also knew the tragedies when their most needed resource disappeared. When lakes dry up and streams get clogged and even ocean levels fall over time. When this does happen, the people whose culture revolves around a smooth relationship with water would have to adapt and find another way to survive or migrate to where water is available. Now that the populations have grown and industrialization has developed in the modern United States, our relationship with water has drastically changed. Now, we simply bring the water to us. Learning to manipulate our resources has been a long journey of development and progress. The first fishing hooks and harpoons were found in a large fish cave in a remote Southeast Asian island, handmade out of stone. By the use of carbon dating, anthropologists have found these tools to date roughly back to 42,000 years ago. The evidence found at this site suggests that the people used the fish to provide over 80% of their diet. While in contrast, the use of fish in the Japanese culture is not only a food source, but it has begun a major spreading around the world through the displays of raw fish that we know as sushi. In Japan, the cutting and preparation of fish is more than simply eating. It is considered beautiful and even tranquilic lifestyle. Different regions of Japan roll their sushi differently and use specific fish to reflect the style of the area. Traditionally, they spend years learning the craft to perfect it into an art, fitting to the highest standards of their culture. To broaden the scope of human cultures meshing with marine, we can look at the more fantastical side with the legend of the Loch Ness Monster. This legend dates back to the 6th century when St. Columbia wrote of the first encounter, sparking an interest in the loch. A century later, St. Adamon supposedly witnessed a large water monster killing a man in the nest, and then in turn, attempting to kill another. This story was also broadcast to the world. Although many generations had passed, and undoubtedly embellishments had been applied to each story, the fantastic tales that blossomed resulted in a culture specific to Ireland, and even more specific to the general area around the loch. Nessie has also been a faithful in drawing commercial tourism over the years. This helps bump up the economy through the sales of monster goods and products. 
Moving now to another culture shaped by sea monsters is Greek mythology. This is a field where hydras, leviathans, and sirens, just to name a few, are all found in an array of resources, such as Homer, fishing logs, and personal records from the time. The culture of sea monsters and sea travel was forged on the shores of coastal communities and then ignited when the unknown happened. Like disappearing people and disappearing ships, they were thought to be lost at the jaws of sea monster. These beliefs have survived the test of time and sparked an interest from folklorists and cryptozoologists who study the rare sightings and catalog them. Because all cultures gravitate to the water, sea monster accounts are found in virtually all cultures. For example, author Avenuis of Aura Martimia tells of Carthagrian explorer Hemclo's voyage in this passage, quote, There are monsters of the deep, and beasts swim among the shallow and sluggishly crawling ships, end quote. Another recollection comes from Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who claimed to have encountered a lion-like sea monster with glaring eyes on his return voyage after claiming St. John's Newfoundland in 1583 for England. Again, in July 1734, Hans Edgar, a Norwegian missionary, reported that on a voyage to the western coast of Greenland, he observed, quote, a most terrible creature, resembling nothing we ever saw before. It was longer than our whole ship, end quote. He stated later in the passage that the creature lifted its head so high it seemed to be higher than the crow's nest, and then it had fins that were giant and helped it propel through the water. Regardless of the time in history or the way it is utilized, marine biology, the study of the sea and all it has to offer, has helped mold cultures into their niches. It has propelled inventions and inspired art. It keeps all of us alive and ties all of us together creating bonds that an anthropologist would be proud of.